And we're going to look at verses 2 through 6. Verses 2 through 6. Peter said a lot of crazy stuff. He really did. Um, Simon, Simon said a lot of stuff. Um, and it was really hard, but I, God was leading me to this one. Is anybody there? Oh, look at you guys, all with your Bible apps. Oh my God, I'm so proud. Um, I'm gonna check to see how saved you are. Let me just check real quick. Um, is your Bible app on your home screen? Got it! <laughs> Got it! <laughs> oh, God knows your struggle. You know, between Spotify and Bible, I was kind of wrestling for that last corner. You know? Spotify won. <laughs> it's all right. He's still working on you. He's still working on you. It's okay. Praise God. All right. At least you got the app. Praise God. Anyway, um, Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 6. You, know, you, you, can, you can tell who somebody is just by their home screen. You can learn a lot about a person just by their home screen. Just give me your phone. I'm going to tell you everything about you. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to read it. Verse 2. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. How descriptive. Hmm. It's for another day. Oh, my phone just went into sleep mode. My apologies. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Jesus, it's good that we're here. Let's build you an altar and tabernacle. I just discovered that you're God. So let's build a tabernacle. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you. Uh, for this opportunity you've given us, God, to come together, Lord, to fellowship and worship, Father. And Father, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us tonight, Lord, through your word. And we ask that in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God, everybody. Let us build a tabernacle. Uh, the, the, uh, this narrative describes what many of us who, uh, you know, have read, you know, the Bible enough times, the, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration or the Transfiguration on the Mount. Um, it describes what we now know as uh, a metamorphosis that was revealed to a selective group of individuals, a transfiguration, a, a change of figure, a, a change of image, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And only three were given that opportunity, those three being Peter, James and John. Peter, Simon Peter, James and John. Interestingly enough, as we read earlier in the text, we find that uh, Jesus was very selective with the three that he chose to go up to that mountain. Um, he was pretty selective about it to show that he was deliberate about what he was about to do. Uh, the fact that he was selective reveals something, that there's something that I'm about to show that only a selective few can see. There's something I'm about to reveal that I can't really show to everybody. You see, there's a thing called access. And some people in your lives must have a limited amount of access. Jesus was selective. He gave, uh, he, he preached in front of thousands, 5,000 families, 5,000 men, from 5,000 men to the 200, to the 120, to the 70, to the 12, and then to the three. 
He was very selective of the three. It was an opportunity, but it was a privilege. It's a privilege that Peter, James, and John had that, that no one else had. And, and I, I think sometimes we, we sometimes misconstrue or we sometimes misinterpret someone who doesn't give you access. Just because I don't give you access doesn't mean that I don't love you. For God so loved the world, he loved everybody, but he gave three particular access. Why is that? There's something that Jesus is revealing, something that he's revealing of himself, that he's only giving a few, a few men. There's something that, that, that gives them the exclusivity to be able to see Jesus in this light, to be able to witness this transfiguration. And, and, and what I find is that their qualifications to, to be this close to Jesus wasn't education. Um, their qualifications was not, you know, what they knew. It wasn't their work experience. It wasn't their knowledge. We know them as, as very lowly men, mostly fishermen. We, we don't know much about them, but we know that they weren't that impressive. So it wasn't their education, it wasn't their knowledge. What was it that qualified them to be next to the most impactful man to ever walk the face of this earth? It wasn't a theology degree. It wasn't education. It wasn't money. It wasn't training. Rather, it was love. The Bible describes Peter as one who loved him. In the breakfast, as Peter revealed to him, Jesus asked Peter, said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, you know that I love you, God. We know James as the one who actually was the first martyr to die among all the disciples. James, he loved Jesus. What gave Peter, James, and John access wasn't that they were better, it was that they loved more. Even Jesus, the woman that came to Jesus and cried and wept at his feet, and even though she was a sinning woman and, and we understand her to be the prostitute, she came and she wept at Jesus' feet and, and washed his feet with, 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 the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the ointment and with the hair. And, and, and Jesus says that the love, because she loved him so much, her sins were forgiven. See, some people will be next to you for what you can do. Hmm. But some people are really, really with you. Not everybody who's around you is really with you. Some people that are around you are with what you are with. And some people are around you are against what you are against. But when they're not against what you're against anymore, then they're not with you anymore. Some people are with you because it's you. Ask the person next to you, are you really with me? Are you really? You know, I... I love it because Peter, James, and John weren't the most educated guys. They, they, they weren't the most trained guys. They weren't the most refined guys. They weren't the most eloquent guys. They weren't the most erudite guys. And yet they've gotten an opportunity to see something amazing. The transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And the Bible describes it very well and chronicles it and says that his clothes were so white, his, so white that it shined bright as light. His face shone as the sun that was described in Matthew chapter 23. In, in essence, what it's saying is, is that what they saw was they saw not simply Jesus, but the glory in him coming out of him. They saw the glory of God. And for one moment in this opportunity, in this time, they received a revelation that they'd never had before. Because you see, when they followed him, they only followed a man that they admired. And now they're about to get a revelation that he's not simply a man that they admire, but he's a God that they should desire. Oh, they see Jesus in his glory coming out, and all of a sudden they realize this isn't just a man that's gifted. This is God himself. How amazing is that to get a revelation and to realize in that moment, a God moment. Anybody ever had a God moment? Yeah. I don't know if anybody know what I'm talking about. You ever had a God moment when this whole time you've been walking with Jesus and he's been doing miracles and he's been doing things that are improbable and at times impossible and, and he's healing the sick. He, he, he's healing the blind and, and he's doing amazing things. He's feeding thousands and, and, and you've seen all the amazing things that he's done. But for, at this point, he's just a gifted man. He's a man who can maybe free us from Roman captivity. And now I get to the point where I begin to realize this isn't just a man who can do things but this is God himself have you ever ever had a God moment when you begin to piece together the things
things of your past and to realize that God was always involved in it in the first place. It's like all of a sudden I'm beginning to realize that God's been working this thing. He's been working this thing. I, I, I lost the job and it may have seen something that shouldn't have happened, but, but because God is in the midst and, and God was trying to redirect me, he was trying to put me into another place. Is there anybody in here that got into a college that they shouldn't have gotten into? Got a job that they shouldn't have gotten? Got, got, got qualified for things that, that they shouldn't have been qualified for? And maybe you would have said it was by happenstance, but how about it was just the God that you serve? They're having a God moment right now. And they're realizing something. That this isn't a man who was born. This is a man who came. Realizing that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Realizing this man had a glory in him that he wasn't a man who had a birthday. His body did, but he did not. Oh, no, no, no. This man was God wrapped up in flesh. God wrapped up in sinews and bones. God wrapped up in the things that we see, but but, but no, 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 this God is a package. What we're seeing on the outside is not really what's on the inside. And now I'm beginning to realize as I get to this mountain that he's beginning to piece apart his flesh. And he's beginning to reveal the glory that is in him. That he's not confined to the flesh that he's in. The Bible says that he humbled himself and made himself of no reputation. He, he, he pulls apart and gives the disciples a peek that this man is not confined to where he was born. He was not confined to Bethlehem. He was not confined to Nazareth. He wasn't even confined to where I met him. He wasn't confined to Galilee. He wasn't confined to his family. This man is not confined to anything. He's not confined to his background. He's not confined to his socioeconomic situation. He's not confined to any of that. He's not even confined to his race. And we ourselves in his image are not confined to race. Is it okay if I preach this for a minute? The Bible says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I ordained you and sanctified you. Before I wrapped you with flesh, I already knew who you were. Before you were Haitian or Jamaican. Before you were Caucasian or Asian. Before you were a race, I already knew you. God is saying, I've, I haven't confined you to your flesh. And I am not confined to my flesh. Can I go a little deeper? Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I was Isaac before I was black. And I don't know about you, but I can't serve a God that I see in the image of race. I can't serve a God that is limited by, by, by a certain socioeconomic situation. I, I, I can't be limited by a God to say that this God that I serve, he's a white God. No, 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 no. I cannot worship a white God. Because if I worship a white God, I have confined him and limited him and given him an exclusivity to a demographic. But here it is, is that even if he's white, I still haven't done enough. Because it's not enough that he's white. Is he German? Is he French? Is he Greek? Is he English? Because the Greeks won't like that he's German. And the French and the Greeks and the French and the Germans still haven't yet to reconcile with each other. So if he's one, then he must be against the other. No, I can't limit my God to that. No, my God is not a white God, but my God's not a black God either. Because blacks can't reconcile with each other. It's not enough that I say that he's black. Is he Jamaican or is he Haitian? Because the Haitians won't like that he's Jamaican. 
And the Jamaicans won't like that he's Haitian. Can I go a little deeper? Uh, uh, it's not enough that he's African. Because South Africans have issues with Somalians. Uh, it's not enough that he's one race or one country. Even the Rwandans can't get, get it together. Hutus and Tutsis destroying each other because of ethnicity. No, Jesus came to reconcile all men to himself. And his ministry was a ministry of reconciliation. No, I cannot serve a black God. And I can't serve an Asian God. Because even the Asians are divided. Mongolians and Filipinos. Even the Koreans are divided by a line. North Koreans versus South Koreans. Tell a Chinese man that God is Jap Japanese. And tell a Japanese man that God is Chinese. Now my God is not confined to a race. Tell him he's a human God. He's not a black God. He's not a white God. He is a human God. He is a God that is not confined to whatever race that you put him into. My God is much bigger than that. My God is much greater than that. There's a problem when you put God in a box. Because when you put God in a box, you've limited what he's actually done, with, which is put himself in your box. He put himself in your grave. He put himself in your coffin. Yeah, you were in the grave of depression. Yeah, you were in the grave of sickness. Yeah, you were in the grave of lack. You were in the grave of poverty. You were in the grave of I can never make it. You were in the grave that I should kill myself. But is there anybody with a testimony to say that he gave me power over my grave? My God came down and gave me power to get out of the situation that I'm in. Touch somebody and say he's a human God. He's a human God, the hypostasis of God. I don't know, it's the last time I want to hear my God is black or my God is white. Or my God is Asian. No, Peter is seeing the God unwrapping, realizing he's not Jewish. Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world. It did not say for God so loved the Jews. It did not say that for God so loved the Greeks. It said for God so loved the world. The Bible then says in the next verse, for God sent not his son into the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Bible says Jesus is ascending into heaven and he says to the disciples, go into all the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel don't don't just go to the jews and paul got it together he said for the jews i became a jew for the gentiles i became a gentile the gospel is not a gospel of division it's a gospel of inclusion if you got a problem with my god and you think that your god is whatever god he is he's not we're not worshiping the same god because the god that we worship should bring us together and not bring us apart Peter's starting to realize that God is not stuck in the box of his flesh. And Peter takes him out of one box and Peter puts him in another. He's not stuck in the box of his flesh, but now let me put him in the box of my opinion. Let me put him in the box of my mentality. Let me put him in the box through the lens of my experience. I see him pulling apart and I realize, oh snap, he's God. For once I'm realizing he's not just a man with power, but he's God himself. And Peter in his impulsiveness says one of the dumbest things ever written in the Bible. He sees God and he says, this is great. Let's build an altar to worship him. <laughs> Jesus is here, but I want to build an altar here and worship him here. when he's here. How often is it that we get a revelation of Jesus Christ and are distracted with the altar of religion and we let the altar of religion 
distract us from the one we're supposed to be worshiping in the first place. You want to know why people don't take the church seriously? Because the church worships, worships itself more than it worships God. The church worships the rules more than it worships God. The church worships the temple more than it worships God. Simon, did you really say that? Did you say, let's build an altar to worship the God that is already here? How often is it that we become so inured by our old way of thinking that we've limited what God really wants to do with us, not acknowledging the very presence in our lives? How many people are going to church every Sunday and Jesus is standing there, but they're still looking here? And they never really experience him. He never really changes them. No, no, no. He never has a chance to because they never allow him in. So what we do is we create fake notions and fake facades of what holiness looks like. If I dress a certain way, then I'm holy. I might do everything else wrong, but because I dress that way, I'm holy. Uh, if, if I talk a certain way, then I must be right. And you know what's funny? It's funny how the people outside the church have more discernment than those in. That we can't even see that even some of the people that look the most holy and look the most righteous are the ones living in the most sin. And they're looking on the outside and they know more than you on the inside because you never really got a revelation from Jesus Christ. Can I go one step deeper? What about you? Have you been worshiping the altar <laughs> and not Jesus? Have you been Simon who says, oh my God, I got a revelation of Jesus, that God moment, and then that moment I lose him to build an image of what I think he should look like. Michelangelo, great artist. Leonardo da Vinci, great artist. He can paint the most accurate picture, but it will never be that which he painted of. And we have become a church of people who have worshiped a picture an altar rather than the real thing. But I love God's grace. You want to know why I love it? <laughs> Peter says the dumbest thing in the world and nobody says anything. <laughs> He's like, let's build an altar. And if I was like, Stick with this whole God thing right now. Calm down. I'm going to deal with you later. And then if you read two or three verses down, Jesus then talks to Peter and reveals to him the truth that his truth is not my truth. Your truth is not my truth. And he says, he says to him, don't worry, Peter. <laughs> you're saying a lot of dumb things right now. And you're always the first guy to speak. But that's all right, because this is what God's grace does. It, it takes the guy who will speak first and turns into the guy who will bring thousands to him. Because Peter was the first to speak a dumb thing. But God's grace makes him the first to speak the greatest thing ever. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, the first person to speak is a man named Peter. Yeah. Simon said something dumb. Peter is going to bring 3,000 to Christ in one day. The very thing that is your weakness, God will take it and make it your strength. The very thing that you did wrong, God can turn it around and make it into something good. That thing in your past that you've done and that you've fallen and maybe everybody ridiculed you and everybody laughed at you and everybody said, uh-uh, uh-uh, you, 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 you're not where it's at. You see, people will judge you by your past. God will use your past to make you into what he wants you to be. 
And this is what he says. He says, if you used to sleep around, it's because God wants to change you so that you can help somebody else who's struggling what you're struggling. If you used to be on drugs, that's all right. God's about to give you a ministry to help others get out of it. God never put you through the wilderness to say you're just going to stay there and die. No, he took you out of the wilderness because there's somebody else who's going through that wilderness that's saying, I need help. And here you are. You can say that God did it for me. He can do it for you. The man with the dumbest mouth became the man with the most anointed mouth. The man with the darkest past can be the man with the brightest future. You want to find somebody anointed? Look for the ones with the biggest screw-ups. Look for the ones who said the dumbest things. Look for the ones who got locked up and came out. Look for the ones who got into some trouble. And when God turned them around, he gave him a word that nobody else, because that word came from my life and came from my experience. I don't just talk about God's grace. I've lived it. Will you accept God's grace today? For by grace are we saved through faith. Let's bow our heads. Oh, God, we thank you. Lord, that you take our blunders and our failures and you turn them around and make them our successes. Father, we thank you that whatever the enemy meant for evil, you turned around and made it good. God, we thank you for a story, Lord. It tells us that even though we've seen things wrong, thought things wrong, done things wrong, said things wrong, that you're still waiting to turn it back around. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation, God, that we didn't just see you as a man, but that we saw you for all that you were, and that is the son of the living God. Lord, we glorify you and we praise you, and as we leave here tonight, God, I pray that you would bless each and every person in this house, that they may receive this word, each and every person on the screen, and they may receive this word, each and every person watching it through their phones, that they may receive this word. And we ask that in your name we pray. Amen. If you haven't given your life to Christ today, I want you to keep your, keep your heads bowed, keep your eyes closed. If you haven't given your life to Christ today, I want to encourage you to make that decision right now. God is not looking for the perfect you. He wants the broken you. The Bible says that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, O oh Lord, do not despise. And maybe you feel like you've been Simon. And you've said some things that you shouldn't have said. Done some things that you shouldn't have done. Made some mistakes. And you think that you're bound by the, those mistakes. But God says, and these things I do. Forgetting the things which are behind me. And reaching forward to the things which are before me. If that's you today, I want you to pray this prayer. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've made mistakes. But I thank you that your love covers a multitude of sins. Father, I confess to you my mistakes. I confess to you my sins. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I believe it. Not only with the words of my mouth, but with all of my heart. If you prayed that prayer, you gave your life to Christ. Let's give God a praise. Let's give God a praise. Let's all stand up. Let's all stand up. Let's all stand up. Thank everybody for coming. I wish I could preach more Simon Says. He said so many dumb things.
Cause I am stronger without me And I am stronger without me God, I am wiser Wave after wave, wave after wave, God, I'm stronger, wave after wave, and God, I'm wiser, wave after wave, and God, I'm stronger, wave after wave. Wave after wave, wave after wave. Say, I am stronger, I am stronger. Wave after wave, and I am wise.
This is a declaration now. And I'm wise. 